And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Acts chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Welcome back. Let's continue analyzing the greatest piece of creative fiction ever written. Chapter 58 has three movements. Our heroes encounter with four effigies of saints, a delightful pastoral adventure, and then Don Quixote's clash with a herd of fierce bulls. Before any of these, we read Don Quixote's famous preamble on the theme of liberty. We have seen the idea of liberty a number of times as a matter of human dignity in the prologue of Don Quixote Part I, as a problematic aspect of the relationship between master and servant throughout the novel, as a particular feature of Cervantes' meditations on slavery, both the new transatlantic slave trade as well as Viedma's enslavement at Algiers. Here, Don Quixote pontificates on liberty as an expression of his escape from the restrictive and decadent environment of the Ducal Palace. But he also elevates the topic to a universal level. Liberty, Sancho, is one of the most precious gifts that the heavens gave to men. She is worth more than all the hidden treasures on land and beneath the sea. For liberty, as well as for honor, one can and should risk one's life. And by contrast, captivity is the worst thing that can happen to men. Don Quixote concludes by formulating liberty as freedom from feudal norms, the obligations to remunerate received benefits and largesse are bonds that restrain the independence of the spirit. The irony here is that his listener, Sancho, seeks a salary from his master, that is, liberation from the organic reciprocal bonds between lords and vassals. Or another way, the Duke is to Don Quixote what Don Quixote is to Sancho. Adding to this irony, Sancho now lets Don Quixote in on a secret. Even given what your mercy has just stated, it's not good that 200 gold escudos in a small purse which the Duke's Mayordomo gave me should remain without acknowledgement on our part. Sancho also notes that compensation means a lot in the modern world. For we'll not always find castles where they welcome us. We might come across some inns where they'll beat us. Don Quixote and Sancho now come across a group of 12 men in a small verdant meadow, another green locus amenus, who are transporting four effigies of saints covered by sheets. Once again, vision is the theme as Don Quixote requests a viewing. If you please, I would like to see them. Money is also a theme. One of the men specifies the value of the images. None of them is worth less than 50 ducados. And so that your grace will see the truth of this, just wait and your grace will see it with your own eyes. Now a ducado is slightly more than an escudo. In other words, the images are worth more than the 200 escudos that Sancho has just reported as a gift from the Duke. Did you know? Thomas Jefferson, author of the United States Declaration of Independence, was a fanatical reader of Don Quixote de la Mancha. These saints inevitably relate to Don Quixote's profession. They are all mounted. In other words, they are Christian knights. George, Martin, James, and Paul. It's a fascinating series, and Cervantes wants us to compare and contrast their value. But which one is the ideal? Two of the saints have political connotations. George is the patron saint of Aragon. James is the famous Moor Slayer, patron saint of Spain. Recall that we are approaching Zaragoza, and that Aragon was subdued by Philip II in 1591, and recall the expulsion of the Moriscos carried out in the years prior to the publication of Part Two. The other two saints represent pacifist alternatives. Martin is famous for sharing half his cloak with a beggar, and Paul 
is famous for having converted to Christianity after being thrown from his horse. Recall that Sancho was mounted when he encountered Ricote in the guise of a beggar. And recall that Don Quixote cited Paul when he blessed the marriage between Tosilos and Rodriguez's daughter. The narrator's descriptions and Don Quixote's explanations of each mounted saint are part of Cervantes's game of perspectivism. George is like Don Quixote. Furthermore, he was a defender of damsels. Martin represents a civilizing trajectory, more liberal than valiant. James recalls the Morisco question, his sword bloody, trampling moors, and crushing their heads. Paul is the archetypal convert to Christianity. In his day, he was the fiercest enemy had by our Lord God's church and the greatest defender she will ever have. Now, if peace is the goal, and Cervantes is criticizing the expulsion of the Moriscos, then Martin and Paul would seem to trump George and James. However, if Aragon's freedom is the issue, then George trumps James. But note that Sancho's humorous quip about the selfish charity of Martin suggests the mutual advantages of market commerce. To give and to withhold require wisdom untold. Moreover, the dialogue circles back to the contrast between peace and war. First, Sancho celebrates the adventure as unique. We have escaped without any frights or blows, nor have we laid a hand on our swords. But then he asks why Spaniards evoke James by shouting, Santiago and close for Spain. Is Spain by chance open and in need of closing? What ceremony is that? Don Quixote pushes the meaning of Santiago even further. This great knight with the Crimson Cross has been given to Spain by God as her patron and protector, especially in the violent encounters that the Spaniards have had with the Moors. And thus they invoke and call on him as their defender in all the battles they undertake. And often they have visibly witnessed him fighting amongst them, crushing, trampling, destroying, and killing the squadrons of the Hagarines. Quixotic mission. How is Don Quixote's famous herring on liberty ironic? A, it rained on the Duke's wedding day. B, Don Quixote owns slaves. C, Sancho also wants his freedom. Correct answer, C, Sancho also wants his freedom. This meditation on the conflict between Christianity and Islam with the theological reference to Hagar deepens the episode's relation to the Morisco question. If some of the Christian Moriscos are infiltrated by Muslims, then in answer to Sancho's query, Spain must resist invasion by its enemies. Questions remain, however, given the pro-Morisco roles of Aldonza Lorenzo, Zoraida, and Ricote, is this portrait of Santiago negative? Or is it a tragic recognition of the need to expel a possible fifth column? Or could Cervantes be saying that Muslim women should be admitted and Muslim men expelled? It's hard to tell, and perhaps this is Cervantes's point. It all depends on your perspective. Don Quixote further highlights the difficulty here by alluding to the Mendoza clan who were notoriously against the expulsion of the Moriscos, but then alluding to Scipio Africanus, who represented the Habsburg kings, who carried out the policy. That's all for now. Join me next time as we continue interpreting the most important literary masterpiece of the Spanish language. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.